Happy Pride Month! So when I use the word pride, some of you may have wonderful memories like I do of community and celebration in the streets, in the parks, in the bars, feeling a common sense of identity, feeling safe in numbers in a way that we from God's life and grace-giving presence. But don't worry, fellow Pride fans, for I bring glad tidings of great joy. While hubris and lack of humility remain grave sins, the Bible also mentions a different, more positive kind of pride, righteous pride, several times, in fact. Paul the Apostle is particularly fond of the various Greek terms for the word pride, and here are a couple examples. From Galatians, each one should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. And in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, I have great confidence in you. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. So the righteous pride Paul talks about encourages us to recognize and celebrate the God-given talents and achievements that we have while remaining, while remaining humble and grateful. It fosters a healthy self-esteem and motivates us to use our gifts in service to others and to glorify God. Doesn't that definition of pride sound great? Doesn't it sound like we should all fully discover, appreciate, and utilize those gifts in service to God and to others? But it's not always that easy. You see, those of us in the queer community often develop a pervasive sense of shame and invalidation that teaches us that we can't be proud of who we are. Growing up in a society that often condemns or marginalizes our identities can severely hinder the discovery and the expression of our God-given talents and gifts. To survive, instead of being who we are, often we hide our light under a bushel. We adopt qualities and behaviors that we believe will make us more acceptable to others and less vulnerable to rejection. This not only causes us to hide our true selves and diminish our light. Instead of embracing our unique contributions, we often bury them beneath layers of self-doubt and fear. And this stifles our personal growth, but also deprives the world of the diverse and beautiful gifts that we have to offer to the human community. And that shame has a serious cost. According to the Trevor Project, queer youth are more than twice as likely to feel suicidal and over four times as likely to attempt suicide compared to their heterosexual peers. For many of you who are part of the community, I suspect you intuitively understand all this because you've lived it. And if you haven't, hallelujah. And even if you don't identify as part of the community, you may have had experiences in your own life too that have caused this story to resonate with you because shame is unfortunately a common experience among many of us for many different reasons. So the journey from shame to pride, as you can imagine, is a long and arduous one for many of us. It's taken me well into my 50s to even begin to understand, process, and heal from the deep wounds that developed in my childhood. So I'd like to share a little of my story with you as an example of what this journey can look like for many of us. I knew I was gay when I was 12. There were no grand revelations, no parades, no glitter or sequins, very disappointed, just the simple realization that where girls were my best friends, boys were both very intriguing and very scary. It didn't take long to understand that my interest in boys would make me extremely unacceptable to my classmates, parents, teachers, and society at large. My parents had no gay friends, there was almost no representation of lives like mine on television, and if there was, it was one of two different archetypes, either tragic lives or flamboyant clowns. And only that has started to improve in recent years in the media, thank God. I had two UCC choir directors who came out um, who, who were actually, I found out later, were gay and lesbian, but wouldn't come out even when young queer choir members were having difficulty and could have used their support. One of them, married with children, died of AIDS shortly after I graduated, taking his secret and his shame with him to the grave. And I just pray for his family every day because of that. 
When you can't see anyone in your entire world living the life of truth and love that you long to live, you do what you have to to survive, don't you? We all do in those situations. You shut your mouth, you hide your truth, and you pretend you're someone you're not. So I stayed in the closet living in secrecy and shame for the rest, most of high school. The only glimpses of connection and joy I got were the acceptance of a few friends in my UCC church choir where I found an incredible sense of community. And in my first young relationship at the age of 16, a friendship in school that turned romantic. But when I suggested that our feelings for one another might mean that we were gay, he went storming back into the closet, treated me like a pariah and like I didn't exist for the rest of high school, started dating girls. I hit rock bottom. And I, if it weren't for the incredible sense of joy I found in my church activities and in the love of my family, I too might not have survived my teenage years. In the case of my choir directors and my boyfriend, living with shame not only harmed them, but also led them to project that shame onto others and onto me, perpetu perpetuating a cycle of hurt, rejection, and unkindness in our community. Ironically, today, that boyfriend is a mental health professional specializing in helping LGBTQIA plus people who are living with mental illness, and I thank God for the journey that took him there, finally. Eventually, I found my tribe in college, away from home and surrounded by new friends and proud role models, I was able to live openly as a gay man for the first time. I had my first healthy, loving relationship and excelled at school. You'd think that that would be the end of the story and my happy ending, but the damage had already been done. Despite no longer hiding who I was, the scars of my past still lingered and linger today. What do I mean by that? Like many of us, that overt shame I had overcome as an out gay man still lived on in a very real way, um, in the depths, in a very real way, in the depths of my psyche. As a matter of fact, it's never really gone away. And it shows up random times and situations to bite me in the butt. How did that happen? Because by the time I finally came out, the disapproving and shaming and invalidating messages I got from society and my environment were already fully internalized. On a deep level, part of me still believed them. The child inside of me was so steeped in shame that it became my entire identity. So to survive, I needed a strategy. So I became allergic to shame. I ran from it. I built walls around it. Every time it popped up its head, I shoved it back down again hard. It became my life's nemesis. According to the author Alan Downs in one of my very favorite books that I recommend to all of you, The Velvet Rage, when shame is present, it usually produces two very specific adaptation mechanisms that are extremely common among my LGBTQIA plus siblings, overachievement and addiction. In my case, I used every fiber of my being to avoid shame by becoming someone acceptable and desirable to society. I sought validation through academic excellence, participated in countless stu student activities, graduated from university with two majors, a minor honors, and a year abroad. I climbed the corporate ladder on two continents, accumulating accolades and possessions to prove my wealth. I think you get where I'm going with this. Add to that five languages, four countries, and immersing myself in everything that I could that garnered praise, I was building a resume so that I could feel better about myself and so that I could make myself acceptable to the world. I simply felt like it was something I had to do. I had no idea why. I thought it was who I was. But no matter how much I accomplished, the shame lingered just under the surface of my skin, always. I avoided shame at all costs, and when any person or situation triggered even the slightest feeling of it, I would hit back hard, way out of proportion to any of the stimulus that caused it in the first place. You can imagine what it's like to be married to me. <laughs> However, I've begun to shine the light of consciousness on it. And when we do that, things like shame cannot survive long in the light of self-examination. I recently discovered another cost of this shame that I've underestimated for my entire life. 
in preparing for the sermon, as a matter of fact. So thank you to you for giving me this insight. I realized for the first time that who I am today has been so entirely shaped by what I thought I had to do to be acceptable and worthy of love that in a really real sense, I have most, mostly no idea whatsoever who I am beyond that attempt to avoid shame. It was a jarring realization. It was like you've built an entire life and all, all of a sudden someone tells you that was built on a false premise. That's not you. That's not who God meant you to be. That's not who you should have been. I'm starting to get glimpses of that true Christopher. Being on the path to ministry is a major part of that discovery. So thank you for being part of that healing journey for me as I find my true purpose and voice in this place and in the world. I recognize this as my true path because I can trace my calling to the ministry way back to my pre-teenage years. Had I felt more worthy in God's eyes at that time, maybe it would have been something I would have pursued sooner, but better late than never. <sighs> Switching gears, another one of the most common coping mechanisms for the queer community dealing with shame is addiction. See, shame is more than just a feeling of guilt or embarrassment. It's a deep-seated sense of worthlessness and inadequ inadequacy. And this overwhelming emotion can drive individuals to numb the pain and seek solace through addictive behaviors. According to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, queer people are up to twice as likely to use substances than their heterosexual counterparts. But addiction is not only about substance abuse, but also about process addictions, like sex, gambling, shopping addictions, or eating disorders. These things can also take control and destroy lives. I honor our siblings in this room and around the world who are valiantly fighting to reclaim their lives through recovery from all these things. So how do we begin to heal from all of this and reclaim our true selves? How do we conquer addiction and reclaim authenticity and sobriety in our lives? Our recovery friends give us great wisdom in this area. Much of this help comes from understanding and embracing the transformative power of a higher power. And in Isaiah, the scripture today, we find powerful messages of redemption and reassurance. These verses remind us that we are not defined by the shame of our past or the judgments of others. God calls us by name, claiming us as God's own. Our creator promises to be with us through every trial, through fire, water, river, ensuring that we are not overcome by the waters of despair or the fires of condemnation. When we internalize this profound truth that we are precious and honored in God's sight and that we are deeply loved, we begin to heal our inner child and dismantle the walls of shame that have kept us from finding and living our truths. Hopefully, in doing this, we let go of what we think the world expects of us and focus on the life that God wants us to lead, one where we are happy and living out the great commandment of loving God, neighbor, and self. Because in the words of the prophet RuPaul of Atlanta, <laughs> if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? Can I get an amen up in here? Amen. Thank you, church. It wasn't until I could fully allow myself to feel God's love by starting to dismantle the walls of shame inside me that I could even begin to approach the idea of standing here today because I simply didn't think I was worthy of it. Though I felt called to the ministry from the time I was a teenager until I could feel and believe God's love for me, I couldn't even imagine it but it took more than just understanding God's love for me to get where I am in my life today. So I'm going to give you some practical tips. Noah? <laughs> Third Carol, thank you. Um, great, and then I press the wrong button and I lose my place. <laughs> you see, even though God's love is central to our journey, we've got to do a lot of the work ourselves. I always like to say that we are co-creators with God in our own realities and lives. And that's a big responsibility to take. So here's some ideas that we can do to start moving from shame to pride. The first one is self-reflect. Self when we spend time listening to the world about what they expect of us, we're not listening to our own souls and we're not listening to God. 
So finding that quietness in whatever way works for you is key to doing that. Experiencing the beauty of God's world, finding what you're drawn to. Embracing vulnerability is a big one. This is not something we're terribly good at as a society, but being willing to take the dare to share your authentic self with others is risky, uncomfortable, but it fosters connections and helps build deeper, supportive communities so that we have the support we need to do this work. I love the way that the author I mentioned earlier talks about the definition of passion. To find your passion, think about where you experience joy in your life in a reliably repeatable way. When you experience that joy over and over again, there's your passion. Go for that. Be your authentic self. Find the places where you find yourself hiding from people and not expressing who you are. I know safety is an issue, and I know we all have to be concerned about that when we express who we are, but where you can, let your light shine. Let others see who you are. And last but not least, choose love. Find the power of love in your life. Find your love for God, which is something that we talk about and work on a lot here, but then stop, listen, and feel God's love for you. That's something that we forget way too often. Turn that love then back on your inner child. Begin the healing of the one who still bears most of your shame. Just as we need God's unconditional love for us, we must then provide it back to the youngest parts of ourselves to truly heal. So this is the sacred journey from shame to pride. And it's why we celebrate pride. Because we are a community who has to overcome almost insurmountable odds to become who we are today and to find the courage every day to do the healing work that I've described to you. If you are an LGBTQIA plus person today sitting in this church, you are a miracle. You are a statistical aberration. Most of us never make it this far. Most of us don't understand God's abiding love for us. So you sitting here today is a miracle, and we honor that, and you are welcome here. Amen. To yes. So to close, I want to do something unusual. I want to invite you to sing a love song to your inner child in a collective act of healing. It's only three minutes long. The text is simple. Carol will put it up on the screen for us. We'll sing the same verse seven times. I ask you to really let the words sink in. Make this a meditative practice if you feel comfortable doing it. Close your eyes and sing this to the youngest part of yourself. If that feels like too much for you in any reason, for any reason, we honor that too. You can participate however it is that you want to. So we'll go ahead and sing, How Could Anyone? Anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul? How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less? And beautiful how could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole how could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle how deeply you're connected to my soul how could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful how could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole How could anyone fail to notice That your loving is a miracle 
how deeply you're connected to my soul. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is And we thank Libby for giving us the rights to use that song today here. If you were brave enough to even begin this journey of healing from shame, then you deserve to live in pride, not just for one parade or one month a year, but every single day. Because the sacred journey from shame to pride is not easy, but it will be one of your greatest accomplishments and a unique work of art that will be your legacy to the world and a testament to the power of God's healing love. Be blessed and reassured in the knowledge that your creator and this community of love will be with you on your journey. Amen. <laughs>